Hi, everybody. My name is Justin Gerald, and I'm the VP of Research at Indie Labs. I want to um, thank you for viewing this video, and also a special thank you to Synthigo for the opportunity to present today. Um, today, I'll be discussing with you our novel technology called the Microfluidic Vortex Shedding Delivery System, or UVS for short, a platform for non-viral based transfection for the development and manufacturing of T-cell immunotherapies. So before I go into the platform itself and what we've been able to discover with it thus far, just a little bit of background on us. We're Indie Labs. We're a CSH company based in Berkeley, California. We are a team of seven with core competencies in microfluidic simulations, engineering, and immunology. We are a venture-backed company supported by several venture capital firms, and we've been able to secure our funding and grow as a company um, because of our novel platform that's geared towards addressing the major pain points in manufacturing gene-modified cell therapies with our current focus focus and emphasis on T-cell therapies. So T-cell immunotherapy manufacturing right now uses viruses and it's a slow, cumbersome and expensive process. The use of viruses is the current standard to manufacture these therapies. However, there are major drawbacks to this approach as seen through the difficulties companies have faced to manufacture two FDA approved T-cell therapies, namely Novartis and Gilead with Camria and Yescarta. This includes extremely high development costs, long lead times, and inconsistencies in manufacturing workflows and products that has ultimately limited the number of patients able to receive these life-saving interventions. Several groups continue to explore the use of electroporation as a non-viral alternative manufacturing. However, this approach is less than optimal as it's been known to have some pretty profound impacts on overall cell states and largely cell viabilities. Furthermore, these impacts have also shown to promote diminished function in electroporated cells. For example, a recent study um, highlighted here, published in 2018, demonstrated that PD-1 negative T cells engineered via electroporation showed significantly less tumor killing capacity in an OT1 mouse model compared to cells generated using a more gentle microfluidics approach. Follow-up studies have also demonstrated and shown significant changes to global gene expression patterns in engineered T cells as a result of electroporation, likely contributing to their altered and diminished function in vivo. Therefore, it's becoming more and more of a challenge to actually envision electroporation as a viable alternative to, one, generate optimal T cell products that we put into patients, and two, to do so at a clinical and commercially viable scale. So we've been motivated by these challenges and inspired by them, and therefore we created the microfluidic vortex shedding delivery system to address these issues. In place of viruses and electrical pulses, our system uses fluid forces to gently and effectively deliver constructs into cells. The instrument, which is highlighted here on the presentation, is roughly the size of a shoebox and can fit into any standard lab hood. The workflow in terms of transfection process is similar to electroporation and has the capacity to process greater than 50 million cells in a matter of seconds and produce what we believe are some of the highest quality transfected cells for research and clinical applications. So the big question is, how does our system actually work? Well, transfection all takes place in a small 5 by 10 millimeter UVS device that's roughly the size of your pinky nail. And within that device are physical posts that are printed in columns to create this post array region. Within the post array region, you know, looking um, closer up to the um, two adjacent posts, what we can see is that the spacing between the posts is about 20 microns in size or about 1.5 or two times the diameter of an activated T cell, which allows cells to flow through without any physical deformation occurring, like squeezing, making our transfection method completely fluid based. Um, to begin the process, a chip is inserted into the instrument, pressure is applied to the system, and the cell suspension containing cells and constructs of interest are pushed through the chip into that post array region where micro vortices are formed behind the post. Cells enter those microvortices and the forces created um, create transient pores on the cell membranes, allowing constructs to rapidly diffuse into the cells. And then the cells then exit the posterior region into a region with less turbulent force, more laminar flow, allowing the cells to recover and repair. And then the cells exit the device and are collected for downstream applications, flow cytometry, in vitro assays, culturing. And ultimately, this transfection process is completed in a matter of seconds. You know, several groups um, have asked us, what does vortex shedding actually look like? what's occurring within the fluid to allow the delivery of constructs into the cells. 
And because this is happening at such a fast rate, it's really challenging to see this all in action. Although we are working internally um, in order to use a high-speed camera to track individual cells within the flow path. However, as a surrogate, um, we use 3D simulations to show what this process looks like. And what you can see here is how fluid flows past these stationary posts. The flow creates regions resembling vortices where we believe vortex shedding and transfection occurs. Thus far, we've been able to successfully validate the delivery of mRNA, DNA, and protein constructs into T cells using our delivery system, starting with an EGFP encoding mRNA that we use for our proof of concept studies and resulted in our first publication which came out um, early last year in scientific reports. Following up on this success, we demonstrated delivery of a chimeric antigen receptor encoding mRNA, um, one that encoded for our universal car with potential clinical applications and an EGFP nanoplasmin demonstrating delivery of a DNA construct. Most recently and excitingly, we've delivered a TCR targeting Cas9 RMP complex with our system, resulting in stable knockout of endogenous TCR in primary activated human T cells. For the purposes of today's presentation, I'm actually gonna focus um, exclusively on our results with Cas9 delivery um, and in an experiment to demonstrate the utility of our platform and how it directly compares to electroporation using Lanza's 4D nuclear, uh, nuclear effector device. Also keep in mind in this um, study, we also use guide RNAs purchased from Synthego. Um, just a little background on this experiment, we deliver track one targeting Cas9 RMP complexes to about 5 million activated T cells using optimal conditions with UVS and electroporation and evaluated the percentage of TCR and C3 double knockout cells, the number of knockout cells generated and expression levels of PD-1, CD25 and interferon gamma for two weeks post-transfection. With UVS, we showed about 25% TCR CD3 knockout in primary human T cells starting at day four that persisted and remained stable for about 10 days after. With electroporation, we observed a knockout efficiency of about 95%, which is similar to reports that we've um, seen in prior literature, which was good for us to recapitulate that. Where things get particularly interesting is when we quantify the actual number of knockout cells generated over time. So despite having lower efficiencies or editing efficiencies with the UVS process, the total number of knockout cells over time was relatively the same between the two transfection methods. As you can see here, we ended up with the same number of cells by day 10 post-transfection with no statistically significant difference. And we believe this is mainly attributed to the higher percentage of viable cells we're able to obtain with our process over time compared to electroporation. It's well known that electroporation in and of itself is a harsh process and can substantially impact overall viabilities and growth rates of cells, which appears to be the case in our experiment as well. At just 24 hours post-transfection, we observed about 90% viable viability in cells processed with UVS that was maintained for the duration of the experiment actually was higher than 90% thereafter. Interestingly, we also observed decently high viabilities with electroporation at about 70%. However, these percentages were anywhere between 10 to 50% less than what we observed at UVS at any time point post-transfection. Here we actually see where UVS specifically outperforms electroporation, and that's again with regards to electroporation, uh, excuse me, um, cell viabilities and, and growth. At day 14, we quantified about 800 million live cells per flask with UVS compared to about 230 million cells with electroporation, or what eventually came out to be about 3.4 times overall increase in the number of live cells, live T cells generated with our platform in comparison to Lanza's. In addition to quantifying cell viability and TCR knockout levels, we also quantified the expression of PD-1, which is one of several protein markers that are associated with diminished T cell function, and found that the level of PD-1 it was elevated in cells processed with electroporation versus UVS at days 10 and 14 post-transfection, indicating to us that the process of electroporation itself could promote T cell exhaustion 
and possibly reduce its function and overall decline as a potential T cell therapeutic in the future. Again, more work will need to be done in order to show whether or not this has impacts to the functionality of a engineered T cell, but this is giving us some early hints of that. Together with PD-1, we also quantified the expression of CD25 as a marker of activation and capacity to proliferate in response to IL-2, and found that these levels were reduced in cells processed with electroporation in the early time points, as you can see here on the bar graph or on the line graph. This may highlight one of, se of, of several potential reasons why we observed a greater proliferation capacity and overall absolute number of live cells with our platform compared to electroporation. An important effector function of activated T cells is the production of cytokines. Therefore, we quantified the level of pro-inflammatory cytokine interferon gamma and found that their levels were increased in electroporated cells compared to UVS in both the experimental track one conditions as well as the non-targeting controls, indicating that the process of electroporation itself likely triggers pro-inflammatory responses independent of TCR engagement, driving the cells more quickly to exhaustion prior to infusion into a patient. So collectively, our results show that our delivery method maximizes cell viability and presumably because it has a gentler effect on the cells compared to electroporation. However, you know, the question comes up as what does it mean to actually be gentler? What evidence do we have that supports our platform is more gentle and specifically preserves the native cell state of the T cell? So to answer this question, we um, further evaluated ev activation marker expression, cytokine secretion levels, and global gene expression patterns in processed versus non-processed cells, and found minimal differences between the two populations at 24 hours post-transfection, again, supporting that gentle nature of our platform. So I've alluded a lot previously um, about manufacturing scale and the question is, you know, the question remains, how many cells can um, we process in a given chip? As it currently stands and with our current iteration of the chip, we are able to process about 80 million cells per chip in about 50 seconds, which equates to about 1.54 million cells per second. And once we process the cells, we observe viabilities exceeding 70% at 21 hours post-transfection, which is likely to approach the non-processing controls over here, which are at about 85, 90% in a couple more hours thereafter. While this already represents a substantially high number of cells that we can process per chip, we're particularly focused on processing cells at a clinical and commercial scale, and therefore we're working on new chip designs to accommodate and have the platform amenable to hundreds of millions of cells for processing. Regarding our R&D efforts for the rest of 2020, we are focused on evaluating three things. Um, one is a validation study comparing UVS and electroporation with multiple donors, looking at those same type of metrics that I showed, but expanding upon them. Now looking at um, more exhaustion markers, more a higher cytokine or different types of cytokines, and quantifying knockout and expansion, expansion potential in unique T cell subsets. In addition, we're working to demonstrate knock-in capabilities with our UVS system by pairing it with CRISPR and using this new type of uh, method called active delivery, where we actually apply a low-strength electric field in our system. Nowhere near to what um, is used in um, electroporation, so we're still focused on preserving that um, native cell T-state, T-cell state, as well as high viabilities. And then lastly, we'll also be looking at multi-gene knockout for T-cell therapy relevant targets, including PD-1 and CTLA-4, and others to further expand the application of UBS to T-cell immunotherapies. In the near-term future, we envision the UVS delivery system in both research and clinical workflows with new applications in T cells, including regulatory T cells and other immune cells in order to generate next generation cell therapies at clinical and commercial scale. 
And with that, um, I want to end by just saying that at Indie Labs, we're really excited about cell therapies, but we've quickly realized that we're never actually going to see the real potential to these therapies unless we overhaul the way we approach manufacturing. Therefore, our goal with our platform is to finally and definitively enable T-cell immunotherapy development and manufacturing through non-viral intracellular delivery and make these therapies available to, ma to the masses. So with that, um, I wanna thank you all again for listening. And if you have any questions, please feel free to, uh, to send me an email. I'd be happy to answer them. Um, and lastly, just again, thank you all and thank you to Synthigo.